When Elise and I lived in Saskatchewan, uh, we lived in a small town that was about 40 minutes from the nearest grocery store, so you had to plan ahead for your meals, right? You couldn't really just go pick something up on the way home uh, from, if you forgot an ingredient or felt like something, having something else that day. Uh, and so every now and then, we would get to the point where our fridge was running a little low, right? But we didn't have the opportunity to go to the city, and so we'd have to make do with whatever we had, and, and uh, sometimes that would lead to some interesting meal combinations, foods that wouldn't necessarily usually go together, uh, had to because that's what we had left. And the most memorable uh, was a meal that was suggested to us by an app, uh, and it's an app that you can get and then you type in, I have this, 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 and this in my fridge, and it will tell you, you can make this out of it. Cool, it's a good idea, so we tried it. We had, on this one occasion, ham and sweet potatoes and apples. And that was about it. So we typed that in, and the recipe came up uh, basically with just the idea of you chop all that into little pieces, and you throw it in a crock pot with a bunch of cinnamon, and you let it sit for a while, and then it'll cook, and there's your meal. Now, all of those foods are good, and, like, they even actually all go together in some fashion, right? Like, I grew up having applesauce with my ham, or you can have sweet potatoes as a side of your ham. You can put sweet potatoes and apples together. You can put cinnamon on those things individually, but something about putting them all together was, was not good. <laughs> it, it felt like there were too many flavors, and it just didn't combine well. It kind of tasted like it was trying to be a Christmas dish, but it was not succeeding. Uh, what we have come to the point in our sermon series where we kind of just had to put together all the topics that were left uh, because we put together the ones that matched well in our doctrinal statement and we preached on those and next week we saved uh, our final one and a big one for the last one and today we kind of get what's left in the fridge so to speak uh, of our doctrinal statement and my hope is that Though there may be some jarring shifts between the topics, uh, this sermon turns out to be more palatable than that fateful Christmas ham mush thing that Elise and I will likely never forget. Uh, I don't know that there will be much in the way of maybe in a, a specific common theme to tie these together. I haven't found it anyways. Maybe you will as I'm talking. Uh, the broad theme of trusting in God's sovereignty might come through. Uh, in each of these things, so maybe you can keep that in mind as we walk through today's message. Uh, let me pray for us as we begin, and then we'll dive in. Father, we're thankful for the chance to come to your word and the convictions that we have from your word, and we just pray that as we talk about various things this morning, uh, that you would impress on our hearts what needs to be impressed on our hearts, that you would grow us in our knowledge, uh, that you would give me the words to say, help me to speak uh, your truth well, and uh, that may your spirit be at work uh, in the hearts of all of us here, that we may receive it well as also. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to start with statement number 11 from our doctrinal statement, which is on religious liberty. Let me read it to you this morning. We believe that every believer has direct relations with God and is responsible to God alone in all matters of faith that each church is autonomous and must be free from interference by an ecclesiastical or political authority, that therefore church and state must be kept separate as having different functions, each fulfilling its duties free from dictation or patronage of the other. There are many good scriptures there for you to take note of as well. Uh, so this statement, this statement on religious liberty, is a fairly Baptistic statement. Uh, and in a lot of ways, this is a statement that's kind of pushing back or reacting to uh, trends and uh, traditions and former dominant viewpoints from church and world history and uh, kind of saying, we, we think that how those things came about is wrong and this is what we think is right. Uh, according to God's word. Let me show you what I mean. So it starts by saying we believe every believer has direct relations with God. This is pushing back against uh, the domination of 
Catholicism and their doctrine for hundreds of years uh, as a part of the Reformation. This was what Martin Luther and the other reformers stood for, that uh, not only the priests can talk to God. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered him. He was speaking. He said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. That you and the father can dwell together individually. If anyone loves me, Hebrews 4, 16 encourages us to draw near to the throne of grace uh, along with later on in the book, Hebrews 10, 19 to 22 Uh, We all have direct relations with God through forgiveness of sins in his son and the indwelling of his spirit. So we don't need a human priest to mediate for us anymore. There's no step that we have to take where we go to someone and that someone can talk to God on our behalf. We now all can talk to God directly. Jesus is our priest and mediator us the word of God says. And so now we each have direct relations with God, and that's a statement that reacts to an era when it was very much taught that, you know, if, if we were in that tradition, you down there would have to come to me up here, and I could speak to God for you. That's, that's no longer true. Christ has torn the curtain, and uh, each of us can approach the throne of grace. Our statement continues. Uh, It says that believers are responsible to God alone in all matters of faith. Again, this is responding to that Catholic tradition that places the church between the believer and God. But God alone will judge you and I at the end of all things, not a priest or a bishop or an earthly ecclesiastical authority. And it is to him that we ultimately need to answer for our deeds, our words, and our thoughts. This doesn't mean that there isn't wisdom in placing ourselves within a body that has the ability to discipline and instruct and correct us, Uh, but it does mean that we are responsible to God. And I can't say at the end of all things, well, the pastor made me do it, or the priest made me do it, or whatever it may be. God won't say, that excuses you, you're fine. No, you're responsible before God, and he will judge each one of us. The statement then moves, and so that, that's what our statement addresses about individual liberty, and then it moves into uh, the liberty of each church. It says each church is autonomous, and this is again a reaction to the, the history of state-run churches, and even uh, the broad denominational um, authoritative method of churching. Uh, I'm not sure if we've mentioned it yet in our doctrinal statement, but FFBC's statement of faith was written about 50 years ago when the church was formed, but a lot of it came from a greater Baptist denominational statement of faith. And so uh, it, it stretches back longer than that. And so the memory comes from times throughout the history of especially Europe as a whole, Uh, Ever since Paul's missionary journeys, up until the Industrial Revolution, more or less, where religion and government were entirely entwined, right? That was just the reality for a lot of church history. It's been a relatively short period of time, when you look at the amount of years that have passed, uh, that we haven't had that as the reality. Now, sometimes that was because the dominant religion truly held the power in the land, whether there was another governor or person in charge or not, the the church was the one who really had the authority, or it also was largely because rulers were deeply religious as well. There were not many atheist or even private leaders throughout much of Europe's history. Uh, The leader was a Christian, a Catholic, a reformer later on, whatever it may be, and that was pretty private, or they were against those things, Uh, In the early days of the Roman Empire, they were for the Roman gods and against this new church of Christ. Uh, And so, because of this entwining of religion and government, religious freedom was pretty much always at stake. Because the seats of power would subscribe to one branch of religion and rarely tolerate those who disagreed. And so, if you belong to the same camp as the person in charge... Good. If you did not, you were persecuted. And 
part of what made the Reformation even possible was the fact that Frederick III, who was the elector of Saxony, the region where Martin Luther lived, was kind of not as staunch of a Catholic as the Pope especially wanted him to be. He was kind of open to these other ideas, and so he said, no, Martin Luther can stay, and he protected him and made sure that the Pope didn't uh, get after Martin Luther like he wanted to uh, in the early days of the Reformation. And so as uh, he allowed Martin Luther to stay, his influence grew and grew and grew to the point where uh, his ideas were no longer just some monk over in some province. It had spread and uh, begun to grow beyond even him. That was because the leader of that region was still a Catholic, but he was like, well, let's hear what this guy has to say to, uh, in a way that many others were not. Now, a common reason for early immigrants to come to North America was fleeing religious persecution by state-run churches that wouldn't accept any other doctrines. This is how the Mennonites started, and many of you are here uh, as a part of that lineage. Uh, Baptist tradition has very much come from this as well. The idea that we do not have bishops or a pope who can decree how this church ought to be run and what we ought to believe, right? We have leaders here who God has appointed to lead the church here. We don't need someone there trying to lead the church here. The example in scripture that we see of the apostles overseeing the whole church uh, was unique because the church was just starting. They didn't have the word of God to govern them and to instruct them and to guide them. They didn't have um, the rich bed of theology that we have at this point in our history uh, by which leaders appointed by God can know how to lead his church. And so the apostles were the ones who answered questions and ran churches uh, all over the early era of the church. But even as we look at the later letters chronologically in our Bible, Paul and the other authors place an emphasis on appointing good leaders in local congregations to lead those local congregations according to, at that point, the traditions and the emerging word of God uh, that could be taught. Now, we also hold that churches should not be run by the state, by government, and that the state should not be run by churches because, as it says in our statement, they have different functions. As I see it in Scripture, God has instituted three institutions for human ordering to organize ourselves. The baseline institution is something Pastor Dan will allude to more next week, which is the family. Uh, just briefly, that's the most fundamental relationship structure that we have as human beings. Where, if all is as God designed it to be, we will be the safest, we will have our most intimate connections. Family is designed for the flourishing of loving spouses supported by each other as companions and the flourishing of children as they are taught and instructed in the ways they should live. It does not always function like that due to sin, but again, in a nutshell, that's what it should be, and that's our foundational institution for human ordering. Then the second one, during this era of history anyways, is the church. This is what God has given in order to order ourselves and organize ourselves, and the function of the church is, we've, we have preached on it already, but it is a community of faith with whom we ought to gather together for formal teaching and worship, as well as fellowship often for encouragement, exhortation, prayer, and support, and many more things. Uh, if you want to go back and see more about the role of the church, uh, that message is up on YouTube just from a few weeks back. So then the third institution, we have the family. God has ordained the family and the church and then the state. God has given governing authority uh, as a divine, he's given them a divine mandate, uh, and that is to organize society for human flourishing. We could add, and, and that's it. That's all they're supposed to do. Uh, when so many people live together in an area, there must be some form of structure. There must be some form of organization. Uh, most importantly, there must be some enforcement by an authority 
of moral codes, ideally God's moral codes, right? Someone must hold wrongdoers in check and allow rightdoers to live their lives. Uh, if we just had everyone living on their own camps and everyone could enforce their own morality, eventually someone would come to dominate anyways, right? This is the reality of human existence. And so there ought to be someone who will hold the line, who will hold the standard. Uh, and God has appointed governments to do this. Organization as well of things like roadways, buildings, commerce, healthcare, etc. These are things that as they are organized, they do aid humanity. It is a wonderful thing when the government provides structure to these things. They can make our lives easier. The government can make our lives easier. It is, it is something they can do. Where the state errs is when it refuses to acknowledge God's authority and begins to think of itself higher than it ought to. And for that, God will hold rulers accountable. He, he will hold them accountable to how well they carried out the mandate that he gave to them, so pray for them and for the salvation of their souls. To return to our statement, though, it correctly identifies that the church and the state have different mandates, right? The church is supposed to be the spiritual community and authority and the worship structure of our lives. The state organizes the broad strokes of society. So the church ought not to abandon its, I would say, higher duty of spiritual direction in order to pave roads, right? The church has a higher calling, I would say, than the state does. And we ought to focus on that, the spiritual direction of the lives uh, that God has brought to us. And the state ought not to attempt to mix the guiding of spiritual community and proper worship of God into its legislative duties, okay? This is the ideal. Does it always work like that? Is it that simple in reality? No, that, that's a very simplistic definition of the roles of church and state. And obviously the state must uphold some moral law and if uh, it is not run by the institution of the church then there will always be the temptation for those in power to uphold their own moral law. And the church, as the champions of the true moral law, ought to speak up, especially in a democracy like ours, for what is right and good and true. And so there's, there's some messiness, there's some interplay between the two. We know that it, it's, it's not completely distinct, but by and large, the two institutions of church and state have primarily differing mandates, and we believe that those institutions should carry them out separately, ideally with goodwill and cooperation towards each other. Wouldn't that be a dream? Okay, so to recap, we believe in the liberty of each individual believer in their walk with God, free of the need for a church-appointed mediator priest to speak to God. We believe in the liberty of each individual church from ecclesiastical governance and the liberty of the church as a whole from control by the state. Okay? Yet that is not all that needs to be said about our relationship with the state. There's my first clumsy transition. Uh, statement 14 is about civil government. And we're going to cover that one next. We believe that civil government is of divine appointment for the interests and good order of human society, that magistrates are to be prayed for, conscientiously honored, and obeyed, except in the matters opposed to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Lord of the conscience, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. So let's walk through this statement as well. Firstly, we believe civil government is of divine appointment. And I'd say by, if we want to go jump to the end, by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Civil government is by divine appointment by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus pointed this out to Pilate during their conversation in John 19. He said, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Daniel 2.21 tells us God changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Job 12.23, he makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. 
Isaiah 41, a number of verses from in there, says, Behold, the nations are like drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Acts 17, 26 to 27. God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Romans 13, 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So the Bible is unambiguous on this point. Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada because God appointed him to be so for his good and perfect reasons and designs. And the same is true for every other current and former and future leader of any country, province, state, city, county, empire, or rural municipality. Every one of them has been divinely appointed by God to their position. For the interests and good order of human society, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Romans 3 to 4 would add, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So again, that's God's standard that he has given to those who rule by which they will be judged. How well did you approve of what is good and bear the sword against those who do wrong? That's God's standard for our rulers. All right? So then our response to those God has divinely placed in authority over us according to our doctrinal statement again, is to pray for, conscientiously honor, and obey. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3 says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Romans 13, 7 says, Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And I I think I need to point out, you and I don't get to decide who's worthy of respect and honor and obedience in this case. Uh, That's something I know a lot of us struggle with, myself included. Just because we don't like the person in charge or do not feel they are worthy of respect or honor or obedience doesn't let us off the hook. This is what God has said of how we are to act towards our leaders. Um, the exception, of course, is that we must obey God rather than men. And there are two specific circumstances where disobedience to the authorities becomes uh, not only right but necessary. When The authorities command something that God forbids, or when they forbid something that God commands, right? If the government commands you to bow down and worship a 90-foot tall golden statue, do not do it. Worship God alone. If the government forbids you from praying to God and insists that you only pray to their God or to them, do not do it. Continue to pray. Obey God rather than men. Now, those are stark examples from the book of Daniel uh, that we can see easily. It it does get a lot more messy, and there's a lot more gray to this. And so ultimately, where we must land in this issue is trust in the sovereignty of God. 
Again, Acts 17, 26 to 27, God has ordered the dwelling places exactly how he wants them to be and the boundaries of the nations and of men for the specific purpose that they might seek him. So Canada is what it is today so that men might seek God. That's what God's word says, that God has ordained it this way so that people would seek him. That's his purpose and his design in how Canada is today and how the U.S. is today and how Russia is today and how every nation around the world is today. He's at work in far grander ways than you or I can see in how he orders the princes of our day and we must simply trust him. That he has sovereignly put us in this time and this place where he wants us for his purpose. And our response should be to serve him with all diligence. And when it comes to knowing when and where the line is of obeying those God has instituted versus obeying God himself, we must trust that he will guide hearts that are abiding in him to know the right time to stand. Galatians 5.25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so as you and I draw closer and closer to God, as our hearts become more shaped by affection for him and the things that he loves and wants us to love, then our decisions will start to become more and more what he wants them to be. As we cherish God, we will do what God wants us to do. And he will guide hearts and minds that abide in him. What we need to do if we feel the government is nearing lines or crossing lines is draw closer to God. The closer you walk with God, the more your decisions will be the right ones. The more he becomes your greatest affection, the more godly your decisions and actions will become. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us that he will guide our paths. Right? Let's move into our third statement. Statement 12 is about the Lord's day. And this one is the one that's a total tonal shift. So here we go. We believe that the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, supersedes the Sabbath for the New Testament church as the primary day of rest. It commemorates the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost, upon which the church began. And as such, it is a day to be kept sacred for worship, assembled spiritual exercise, and rest. Some points about the Lord's Day. The early church observed the Lord's Day. It's mentioned a number of times that that's when they gathered together, and that's what they started to call it. Even uh, by the time John was writing Revelation, uh, he says, those visions came to him on the Lord's day. I was on the Lord's day. These things happened to me. Um, That's when they met together and what they called the Lord's day, which was what we now know as Sunday. Uh, They called it, I don't know if they called it Sunday, actually, I'm not sure but they called it the Lord's Day. It is the day we call Sunday, and that is the day that they chose, we believe, because it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, and it's the day that Pentecost happened on, right? Uh, Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, and 9, Luke 24, 1, John 21, and 19, they all note that the resurrection happened on the first day of the week, which Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath day, was the last day of the week, so Sunday was the first day of the week. That's the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And so we commemorate that by meeting on Sunday. Further proof of that is that he was crucified the day before Passover, which was a Sabbath day, right? And uh, the Gospels make specific note of that, that that's why they had to take him down from the cross so quickly, was because night was coming. The Jewish day starts when the sun goes down. It's different than how we we observe the start of the day at midnight, which actually makes less sense, let's be honest. Uh, When the sun goes down, that's the end of the day and the start of the new day. That's how the Jewish tradition happens, right? And so the Sabbath starts when the sun goes down at six or seven o'clock or whatever it was. 
And then that's the start of your Sabbath day all the way until the sun sets on the next day. Uh, and so that's why even in creation, here's a fun fact, it says there was evening and there was morning the first day, the second day, the third day, because the day starts with the evening when the sun goes down, right? So there was evening, then there was morning. Right. Cool. Okay, anyways. That's why they wanted to take Jesus' body down, because the sun was about to set and it was going to be the Sabbath, and so then they would have had to leave him up because they wouldn't do any work on the Sabbath, uh, and so they took him down ahead of that. And then he rose from the grave the day after the Passover day. Anyways, Pentecost also happened 50 days after Passover. So Passover, again, was on a Sabbath, and then they would do seven sevens, uh, which is seven weeks. That's 49 days, uh, which would take you that many Saturdays along, and then they would add one day, and that's when the day of Pentecost was, uh, which is when we would say the church started because the Spirit of God came upon the church. And so that's why the church began to meet on Sunday instead of on Saturday as they had before. Now, interestingly, uh, I think it's often pointed out that the Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that's not directly repeated in the New Testament. And so I think this has led some people to go, okay, well, maybe we don't need to observe that one then. That was a Jewish thing, and now we are different than them, and so that faded away because they didn't repeat it. They repeated the honor your father and mother, and you shall have only one God, and all of those things. Didn't repeat the command for the Sabbath. There isn't actually any command given about a certain day in the New Testament that you should meet on this day. It says we should continue to meet. It doesn't say which day. But I think that the practice was certainly there. Whenever it's mentioned that they were meeting, it's on the Lord's day. It's almost expected. And I think that's because the Sabbath wasn't actually instituted at the giving of the law. It was instituted by God before the fall of mankind on the, last, the first day after he was done creation. Right? God created the world in six days. And then Genesis 2, 1 to 3 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. I think this is our key text for us to appeal to in order to understand what God is calling us to with how we actually order our weeks. This is significant, right? Because God did not have to rest. Let's make that pretty clear. He's God. He didn't have to take a day off after creating for six days. He wasn't tired. He wasn't worn out. He wasn't spent. He's God. And so the fact that the God of the universe rested from all his work in creation and then declared that we should follow suit, that should catch our attention. We should ask, what is this rest supposed to look like? And I'm going to keep using the word Sabbath as we go through it. That's just the Hebrew word that means to rest. And in my mind, it just designates a, a different kind of rest. From our statement, this is what we say it's supposed to look like. It is to be kept sacred for worship, assembled spiritual exercise, and rest. So worship of God. This is where you're going to get kind of the, the fire hydrant of theology uh, in very concise words because there's not a lot of time to wade through a lot of what Sabbath rest is, and I'm still figuring it out myself. But anyways, Sabbath rest at its core is a recognition of our finiteness and God's infinite qualities and sovereign provision. It is a way that we worship God. If your day of Sabbath rest does not include worshipful recognition of God, I would posit you're not resting in the way that you should, nor will you ever get as much out of your rest as you could. Our Sabbath rest day should be full of praise to God that he is good, and that he provides rest from our labors, and that he provides all we need, even as we take the rest he says we need. So our 
Sabbath rest should include worship of God. It should also include assembled spiritual exercise. This was the early church's tradition, and it really makes sense. If you had to work six days a week and work hard, there wasn't much time to meet with your fellow believers. And so on the seventh day, on the Sabbath rest day, you, it would be a joy to go and meet with the other believers. Sabbath rest desires the company of God's people where one can be safe and encouraged and built up and prayed for and honest. It ought to feel a little like letting out a pent-up breath when you walk into the presence of God's people because that's your people. And to go through the exercises together of singing songs, of listening to the word of God, of service together, that we know strengthen our walk with the Lord and renew us for a new week. To set aside time to be at a place where you are constantly and consciously being drawn towards God by what goes on, as opposed to the normal rigors and pressures of life which constantly draw us away from God. For six days of the week, we have to be on our guard by what comes into our life because it's not hardwired to draw us to God. But when you're here, that's our prayer, is that you don't have to be on your guard. You know that the things that happen here are good and will help you in your walk with God. You don't have to be wondering and discerning and trying. You can trust the people here. You can trust the songs and the singing. That's what it should feel like when we come into God's, the presence of God's people. We should also set aside our Sabbath day unto rest from work as a measure of trust that God will provide all you need, even if you don't work on that day. And I admire farmers greatly in this area. Their, their trust is much more tangible. If you see a farmer here on a sunny Sunday during the harvest, you know that they are actively trusting God, that he'll provide a way for the harvest to be collected, even if they aren't out on that day. Resting from our work also means aligning our lives with what God says is reality, that we can't maintain a schedule of work every single day of our life. We need rest. God has created us, and we need rest. We should rest from the normal rhythms of life, because God has declared this day holy, which means set apart. Your Sabbath day should be set apart from the other days of your week. It should be different. And there's a difference, I believe, even just between regular relaxing and Sabbath resting. A Sabbath day is not just a day that God provided for us to sit around on the couch. We ought to be intentional in how we spend our Sabbath days that they would refresh our souls and our minds and our hearts and our bodies and ready us for another week of labor. We ought to cultivate habits of rest that draw us to God and restore us and do those things on our Sabbath days. God, in his sovereign design, in his sovereign designing of us, has said, you need to take a day each week to acknowledge me, to acknowledge your dependence on me, to acknowledge that you're not me, nor can you truly provide what you need without me. And you know what? It is good to rest in the Lord. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Psalm 62, 1 says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. Not in football, not in movies, not in whatever else we sometimes try to find our rest in. Truly my soul finds rest in God. Now I am far from good at this. I still have a lot to go on my journey to understand and live out, live out this idea of Sabbath rest. But the more I think about it and the more that I look 
at what the Bible says about it, the more I believe many of us are just scratching the surface of what it means to truly set apart a day unto the Lord and to truly rest in him. Let's pray. Father, we've covered a lot of ground this morning. Help the things that need to stick in our hearts and minds to do so. Build us up in our knowledge of how to live for you. Help us to live as those set free from our sin by the blood and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we receive him as our Lord and as our Savior and experience the only true liberty that matters, that from sin and death. May we live our lives in light of the knowledge that we have unhindered access to you in prayer and life and that we are each individually accountable to you and you alone in the end. Father, may our, com- may our country continue to be one where your church is free to worship and to gather and to reach out to our communities without fear of interference from the state. But help us, Father, not to take that freedom for granted and to become comfortable and complacent. May we live up to the amount of freedom you have granted to us and take full advantage of the days we have, knowing that you may take it from us if we do not invest wisely the privileges you give to us. Father, grow our trust in your sovereignty as we interact with our government. Help us to honor and pray for and obey them as we ought, and give us great wisdom in the days to come where it looks like we may need to discern the line to stand on for what you say is right instead of what man says is right. And Father, help us to grow in our understanding and our intentionality with how we Sabbath. Bless the Lord's day in our minds and our hearts and help us to know the best ways we can worship you in the ways we rest. May this assembly on Sunday mornings be a great place of rest for your people. May the habits we put in, may the habits we put in place for how we spend our Sabbath days draw us to you, the ultimate source of rest for our souls, that we may serve you all the better throughout the other days of the week as we find in you true rest.